Hello, this is Morris Party, and I'm very flattered that I've been asked to give a screen flow of what I did to achieve the mixing results in Moonlight for my heart in my heart by Jenny Lee Hodgins. So I'm going to try and share here a little bit of how I did what I achieved and what the process was, what I was listening for as I went along. So what I have right here is my basic template that I start from. I've added a lot of things that are not in my template normal, normally, but uh, there are a few aspects that I have because a template is a fantastic tool for essentially creating your own mixing board. So, so a template is something that you, where you can route things like reverbs and delays and have them at your beck and call instantly rather than having to set them up from scratch every time you want to use them. So in trying to make uh, the audio on Jenny's lovely composition better than how it was delivered, the first thing that I noticed just by looking at the two track right here is that the audio is clearly much stronger in the left channel than in the right. You can just see that with your eyeballs uh, regardless of using your ears. So the first thing that I did was to try and address that. And one of the best tools for handling uh, stereo balance issues is the Brainworks BX Digital, and they are now on version three of the software. You basically have a mono EQ section. The, uh, the mid, the center of your image is right here, and the sides are controlled in EQ via here. And in the middle section, you have some fabulous stereo control tools. So really, the first thing I did was to figure out where the piece uh, balances in the left to right image. So I simply played the, pl the piece and adjusted this knob until it was more centered instead of being so heavily on the left. So I'm going to play the piece and we'll take a listen to how it started out as with a zero or the center point here. So you can hear that is way on the left. So I'm simply going to adjust this knob until I hear it much more in the center. So that's a lot more in the center right there. One thing you can do to try and check your work is to take things to the extremes and just hear what it sounds like if you go, say, too far. And then you can sort of hone in on the right spot by knowing which way is too far on both ends of things. Of course, right there, I realize I've done the uh, standard mixer mistake of adjusting knobs on a plugin which has been bypassed. <laughs> I don't know if I had it bypassed the whole time, but uh, let's do this again. I 
forgot to mention one other thing that I noticed is that I actually have the left and right swapped. This is because normal piano perspective has the low frequencies on the left and the higher frequencies on the right. And as the audio is presented, it's not really clear on which side there are more lows or highs. Um, but I think overall there was more in reverse of what is expected. So I just hit the swap button, which is this one right here in Brainworks BX Digital. So the other thing that you can use <coughs> besides your ears is that there's a balance meter. So you can try and get it so that you're relatively even around the center point. Correlation is also useful to take a look at. Zero or a, a plus one would be a strictly mono image. So the other thing I, I adjusted is the width. I felt like the overall width as the audio was presented was a little bit too wide. And because the stereo image is a little bit funky presented, I felt like narrowing the image and making it a little bit more mono made it seem just a little bit more natural. So, so right now, I will let you hear what it sounds like going to mono, which is where the stereo width would be at zero. 100% means the stereo width is the same as how it came into the plugin. And if you go greater than 100%, you're actually creating an artificial stereo wideness. And in many mixes, a little touch of extra width can sound really good. But if you go, just like with many things, if you go too far, and this will let you go up to plus 400%, that can create a very unnatural sound where it, our brain doesn't even know how to really process it because it, it makes the, it can make the sounds the left and right image wider than what your speakers are it's so anyway enough of that let me let me just play the results so i'll start with 100 which is the same stereo amount as it came in reduce it down to 0% which is mono and that will, you'll see the correlation go to plus one, meaning that I, th I think mono's plus one or zero, I forget which off the top of my head. And then I'll make it wider than how it was originally recorded. <laughs>
So plus one is mono. Minus one, which we reached when I went to uh, the ridiculous extreme, means that your left and right are out of phase with each other. And that, that sounds very unnatural. <clears throat> Excuse me as I deal with getting over a cold. Uh, just a couple other things in the BrainWorks Digital, and then I'll move on to various other plugins. I have MonoMaker set so that everything below 80 hertz is mono. This is just a good practice in general for no matter what type of mu music that you're doing. There's not much information in, the p in this piano piece that gets near 80 hertz. I mean, maybe the lower notes are going to hit that a little bit. So it's not really doing a whole lot in this case, but there's also no harm in it. And then I have a little bit of gentle EQ scooping out these high mid areas. Because I, I felt like the, the audio as presented is a little mechanical. And so, so the hammer attacks seem kind of bright. There seems to be a little bit of extra high frequency stuff happening so so i did start to carve out a little bit of that right here in the brain works so enough of brain works uh let's go on to some other plugins the next thing i noticed I, actually i noticed it after working with the audio a little bit, is that the attacks of the hammer, especially on the higher notes, were a bit sharp and piercing. So rather than trying to eliminate that via EQ, which will also take away the brightness, I opened, I grabbed the SPL transient designer and simply pulled back on the attack. So I'll play it with and without. Uh, this is the power button on the SPL Transient Designer. So I'll start without. So you can hear it's a very, very subtle effect. Surprisingly, I can pull this all the way down and it doesn't really soften the attacks that much. It's just kind of the nature of the audio that that the attacks just are what they are. There's only so much you can do with processing of this nature. The next plugin in the chain, this is just something I have on every track by default. This is Britson from, I believe the company is Sonomous. Uh, it's, a, it's pretty inexpensive. It's about $40, if I remember. And um, it just gives some traditional console warmth. <coughs> so I, had, I have the, both the on, which, is, which I believe passes the audio through a little bit of saturation, and then there's also a fat button. Now, honestly, I can barely hear any difference running it through this way, but it's uh, fairly light on the CPU, uh, so no real harm in it. <coughs> Um, I actually l really love the high and low pass filters on this uh, plugin. So that's why I have it in my template is that anytime I need to roll off 
the lows, I can just grab it right here. Anytime I need to roll off the highs, I can do that with this knob here. Now we get to the more surgical EQ. FabFilter Pro-Q2 is one of the most beautifully designed EQs that is out there. It's just an amazing plugin, incredibly flexible, fabulous features built into it. So I've got four edit points, and I simply added them one by one. One of the really cool features is that you can hit this button to solo what that what is happening in that EQ range. Uh, one other thing I'll mention is that this super high boost it, from 6K and up is only okay because there's very little information in that frequency range in the original audio. If there were a lot of 6K and up in the original audio, then boosting th by 3 dB would have made it super harsh. But since there's so little, then it, it just as adding a little tiny bit of high end and what's often called air. Um, and then I've got a couple of this a uh, high mid at 2K scoop. Again, trying to get rid of those harsh frequencies. A little bit of scoop at 600 hertz. This is the boxy region. And then when the low notes happen in the audio, they actually poke out a little bit too much. I, I love low end and bass, but in the overall scheme, those lower notes, kind of, when they were hit, kind of poke out a little bit more strongly compared to the top end of the piano. So, so what we're left is after scooping all these areas, is that this range of 200 is essentially boosted because everything else around it is cut. And that's kind of a warm range. Uh, so, so this area here is nice base. You get into super low base from in this range here. Uh, it, but the, the tricky thing is that just above the lovely low end, if it's not in balance, you, you're going to get a lot of boxiness. Like if, if we boosted in the three to 600 hertz range, that's going to be total boxiness. And then again, because we've scooped throughout, then in essence, this, this range right here, which is at about 1K, is essentially boosted. And 1K is um, right in the center of our frequency clarity hearing range. So I'll, I'll play the piece again and I'll show you what it sounds like when you solo out these separate boosts. Of course, why is nothing happening? Because I bypassed all the plugins so I could add them back in one by one. So you can hear when I had it soloed, you could hear that that ticky um, hammer strike kind of thing. So so, but but it wasn't very loud. There's not much information happening up way up there in the six K and higher. 
but adding a, a just a little bit it gives some clarity and brightness. So you can again hear that when I solo this one, 2K is actually pretty high by itself. So when we hear just that 2K, it's it's very high. When I solo the 600 range, that's total boxy city. You can hear it's if if that were the area that we were boosting, you'd get a very very boxy tone. So here's the other uh, important mixer technique. Whenever you do something, w anytime you make an EQ move, for, for people new to, to mixing an EQ, you're like, okay, I'm changing the sound, but am I making it better? Is it actually better? It's different, but do I like it better or not? So so that's where, just like with many things, the more you practice and do so that you can make EQ and mix decisions more quickly, you're better able to judge, is this better or not? What, but again, going one way to, to check yourself and to say, are the moves I'm making better or not, is to make the move and then A, B it. Is it better with or without? And so, so this is kind of the, the process that I use to come up <coughs> excuse me, with the EQ curve that I did. Uh, and FabFilter is great because I can click one of these nodes and turn the power in essence. So I'm bypassing just this node or turning it on or off. So I can play it, turn it on, turn it off, and go, do I like it better with or without? Again, it's fairly subtle. <coughs> this is not even a 4 dB cut in, in this range. But if you take all these moves together, the, the other thing you can do is do I like all of these moves together better or not? So again, play the whole thing, bypass and unbypass, and think to yourself, do I like it better or not? And for me, there's no question that when it's in, it sounds more like a real piano. It's taken out some of the harshness and, and kind of rounded the tone overall. So, so that's where I, as when I'm mixing, I try not to fall in love with, oh, it's definitely going to sound better if I pull out the, the boxy frequencies at 600 or 300. Um, so again, just compare. Is it better with or without? Does it sound better if I do that or that? And when you're making moves that are fairly subtle, when you're starting out in mixing and trying to learn what does it sound like with more 600, what does it sound like with less, try extremes. 
So obviously plus 30 DB at 500 is extreme. And and but you can ease so you can easily hear what it's doing. Uh, and likewise what is what is minus 30 DB in that range sound like so you can easily hear it and that will help you as you hone in okay yeah I want a little bit more in this range or a little bit less even even when hearing the subtle moves are are very hard when you're first learning about EQ and and what what frequencies what what does 600 Hertz mean what what does that sound like it's a number but then translating that to what you hear is just a process of practice. So this is obviously very drastic. You can hear that I've essentially, I've almost cut the entire sound of the piano by, by removing this. Um, so, so this is extreme. I, you would you would hardly ever need to make a move this extreme, but again, when you're learning, it, it's just great to he, he really hear. Okay, this is what something sounds like wh when I completely cut at 500 hertz. Ouch, that's a little painful. So back to about where we had it before. All right, enough on the Fab Filter Pro Q2. So I think the next thing I was looking for again the the fi the fight here from the mixing point of view it is simply that the original sounded a, a bit artificial a little <coughs> excuse me a little fake and and how to take this very mechanical sounding original try to round it out warm it up and so from the fabulous folks at plug in alliance the next thing I grabbed is this Lindell EQ. This is replicating what happens on a traditional analog console. I have it turned off right now. There's this EQ section ha is happens right here and you can turn that the whole side on or off here. And it's got an analog button here. I don't know exactly what the analog but button is doing but that's where I was looking for these kinds of things to give it that increased warmth. For me, this is one of the first subtle yet not subtle moves. <coughs> um, it, it engaging th the, this EQ really adds a bit of sheen, um, that analog goodness. Um, it is a little bit louder. That's another mixing trap. That, that we all need to be aware of is that if you compare two sound sources, one is louder than the other, our natural bias is to think that the louder one sounds better. So it's always worth trying to level match any mix changes that you make so that you don't fool yourself by thinking something sounds better just because it's louder. Uh, w one of the features this plugin has to combat that is that it's got an input pad 
So I could try to level match before and after a little bit more so that I'm only judging it based on what the plugin's adding to the signal. So now at this spot, it's much more level match than where I had it, which was about there. But even level matched, I can tell the main thing this is doing is providing a boost in the high frequency range. I have the high set to 10K right here because as we, as we learned by opening up the signal in the fab filter where you've got the um, spectrograph of what's happening, there really is just not much signal from 5K and up. So I, I knew that by the time I got to this plugin, I, I want to set this as low as I can because there just is not much happening. The other settings here are for 15K and 20K hertz. I've also got a little bit of boost in the low, and I believe that says 80 right there. So you can hear it's just when I take the EQ out, it's a little bit more brittle, so, and which is a little surprising because I'm boosting in the high range. But it, the ears don't lie. If it sounds better, it is better. So that's enough of that, or that's everything that I did on a track basis. The... So I'll sh so the rest of what I did is essentially on my master bus. And the way I have my template set up, this, this is where I do my master processing. I, I, this is a fabulous little plug-in. It's, it's not affecting the signal, but if you need to boost or cut, the the level overall it's very cool to just be able to do it right here like th with this i have it linked left and right so that the one move will affect both sides very handy little tool to have in my template the next thing that that i keep in my output chain right here as a, this is the pre-master feeding right into the output is the a Cush audio console emulation so this is emulating going through a transformer and what that does is just add a little bit of saturation so i'll just show with and without So again, this is one of those cases where just running it through this plugin is making it louder, which will kind of fool us into thinking it's necessarily better. One other aspect of this particular plugin is it's got dual LEDs to help you know how hard you are hitting this transformer. So what I'll demonstrate now is what happens when you turn it to the extreme. So again, when you're making subtle moves and you're trying to learn what does this process add, I want to add its subtle goodness, but I want to understand what it's doing to the signal. 
Just, just move it to the extreme. Hear what the extreme move does, and that helps your ear find what the subtle move is doing or not to your signal. So obviously at the extreme, that sounded awful. <laughs> that That is saturation going harder and harder and harder equals distortion. Saturation and distortion are actually different spots on the same spectrum. Saturation is adding subtle harmonics versus distortion is adding major harmonics to the point of uh, clipping. So, to me, it, the, the original audio <coughs> does not need much more saturation than how it came. Um, but but I, I like what this plugin is adding in a very, very subtle amount. So that's why I kept, I kept the needle below. If it were, say, a rock and roll track and you're looking for more aggression in whatever you're mixing, you'd want to get these green lights hitting more often. But for a piano piece, you don't want distortion. Uh, so just a little bit of added saturation just warms it up a little. Moving on, um, this Klanghelm compressor is to me amazingly transparent. It, it replicates uh, compressors that in, in pre-digital days would cost thousands and thousands of dollars. In a digital form, it's, it's a, to me extremely clean. I'm not, I'm not using any makeup gain at all because this doesn't need it. But just a little bit of compression, six on the dial. Uh, you know, six doesn't mean anything. This doesn't necessarily mean you're getting six dB of compression. But just I felt in this range, it's just evening out the tone of the piano in a fairly transparent way. There's, there's, we're not introducing compression artifacts. O over compression can sound really, really bad. And is the opposite of trying to get it get something to sound more natural. You want to have nice dynamics in order for an instrument to sound natural. So I. You can see this. This is a gain reduction meter, and if I turn the compression level higher, you will see more gain reduction. So I'm using it at a point where we're getting even zero gain reduction. So this is barely doing anything to the signal. But but again, I'll bring it to extreme so you can hear what an extreme version would do. So that is very, very extreme compression. This is cranked absolutely to the max. And it's affecting
I apologize. It's affecting the, the way I have my mic routed. Um, so yeah, so that's extreme, and yet it's still relatively natural. That's why I find this particular compressor really amazing and wonderful for fairly transparent compression. So you could hear the difference when I took it in and out, at even at an extreme setting. But the way I have it used in my result, very, very subtle. All right, I think I essentially have only, well, maybe a couple more things to show, and then I'll wrap this up. Uh, th this is, I have a lot of plugins from Plugin Alliance. I've followed their offerings for a while. They run sales on Black Friday, and they run sales throughout the month of December. And when, when they released this, it was at an introductory price, and some mixers who I respect talked about how amazing this was. This is a saturation box. Um, I, I love saturation boxes because I'm a, basically a rock and roll guy. And um, this can be used, again, from subtle saturation to extreme. And, and again, with the audio that was presented us to, for this assignment, the basic problem was that it sounded a bit artificial. So how, how can I warm it up? How can I add analog warmth to the, the original signal that felt very digital and brittle? Digital and brittle. And so I threw, added some black box to the chain. So again, uh, I'll show what this sounds like in extreme and just sh it's just useful to hear what the different knobs on this thing do in an extreme way it's going to make the piano sound awful but that way again it helps you hear what the thing does even when used subtly Just to describe a little bit more what's going on here, the pentode is the softer saturation. Uh, I forget if they're even or odd harmonics. And the triode is harsher overtones, harsher saturation. So especially with the piano, I, I did, and, and these also cascade. So. If you had triode cranked all the way up, but nothing happening in the pentode, then nothing would be reaching the triode stage. So that's where I left a little bit of pentode uh, saturation, what that was adding, but kept the triode even like barely noticeable. Uh, the last thing I will talk about are is the reverb so here's something i did that i felt was relatively important normally i actually have the bx digital in my output stage right here but i realized 
if I send the imbalanced original track to the reverbs, I would be sending into the reverbs imbalanced left and right. So, so I just, because this is a one track piece, like if I were mixing a multi-track, I would have probably given the piano its own BX digital, fix it up, up front, so to speak. But because this is a, this is a one track assignment, I could do things that I normally wouldn't do. So I simply moved the BX digital into the original track. And I have three reverb set, sends set up right here. This is my hall, my room. This is a very, very short ambience. Um, this is a delay, and this is my parallel compression. But I didn't send from here. I didn't want to even take the time to figure out if the sends were pre or post plugin. So, so I put the sends into my pre master slot right here. Normally, I do not have verb sends in my master. In my, in my pre-master slot, but again, this is a this is a one-track piece, so I could do funky things that I wouldn't normally. So I simply copied my sends. So again, th so this is hall, room, ambience, uh, delay, great for pop tunes, not so appropriate for piano, and parallel compression if needed is right here. So what I did was just simply start with all of the verb sends off and test it out and see what I liked. So again, I'll, I'll show you what each of these do going all the way to extreme. Apologize for any distortion that's happening because of my screen capture. So you could hear what each of these is doing. Delay is lovely, but not for this piece. <clears throat> Parallel compression is a great way of increasing volume without really increasing the peaks. And so the last thing I'll just do is, is show you really quickly what I have on each of these by default. And if, I would change them if needed, but it's handy to have a standard set of tools to reach so that you know what they do, you, you know where on the dial approximately it's gonna sound good so you can dial it right in. So for the hall, this is the Lexicon PCM. I have it set by default on large pop hall dark. Reverb time is 3.1 seconds. So if I needed to adjust the verb, I've got all these controls here, but you can accomplish a lot just by determining how much you're sending into the verb. One other trick with verbs 
is to roll off <coughs> the extreme highs and lows of what you're sending into it. So on the input to the verb, I am rolling off everything from 88 hertz and down and also rolling off anything from 12 kilohertz and up. So the, by rolling off the loads, you're preventing rumble and, and the very low end from getting too muddy. But by doing it on the input rather than the output, you're, you're letting um, the verb reach the full frequency of its results. You're just controlling what's coming into it. Very, very uh, advanced mixer technique right there. And again, I don't, I don't think about this because I put it into my template and it's just, and once you do that, it's just there. Um, and then for my room, I, Valhalla Room, this is an amazing, I absolutely love this reverb. It's $50, one of the best values in reverb. If you need, a, if you're looking for a third party reverb, highly recommend anything from Valhalla. They have a vintage verb, they have a room, I think they have a plate now. It's just so easily controlled. Um, pre Pre delay is right here. Your your main reverb time is right here. So just adjusting this up or down to what you need. Uh, very very easily controllable. Uh, and a fabulous amount of presets. So if you want a cathedral, just bam. Here's a list of cathedrals. Try them out. You need a hall. You need a plate room. Whatever. A you need an ambience. They all sound great right out of the box, and then you can tweak them just what what you need. So, so if you have basic, like, if you have, uh, if you're looking for a room sound and you get a snare big room, and it's like, oh, there's too much decay, you just shave it down until it sounds the way you want it. Fabulous verb. I very recently found Seventh Heaven. This is an emulation or um, a more sophisticated interface to Bricasti impulse reserve impulse responses. If you're not familiar with Bricasti, it's a ex very very expensive thousands of dollars outboard processor outboard reverb processor. It it sounds so clean and clear. The tails of the reverb are just are so smooth it's that makes it very realistic so this is a very inexpensive way to get what would cost thousands of dollars in an outboard box in a very inexpensive uh, DSP form I, I believe it's seventy dollars might go on sale for fifty dollars and uh, so I have this I'm using it for ambience and in in this project <coughs> for me I felt like it did sound better with a little bit of ambience it, 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 again it was combating the electronic sound of the original to make it sound a little bit more natural and lively so I will leave it there I think that is I think that really covers everything that I did to the signal. Again, thank you to Vic for the incredible group of film scoring practice. Thank you to the all the admins. Uh, I know it's a lot of work administrating a Facebook group. You are doing an amazing job of providing all of your members with these fantastic tools and resources. So thank you for all the work that you're putting in. And especially thank you to Jenny. <laughs> this is a fabulous piece. Very beautiful. 
As, and and I, what I love about this is we can listen to it uh, 20 times in a row and not get sick of it. So th thank you, Jenny. Great job.